Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And we're at the Galveston Maritime Museum today, home of USS Stewart. She's a World War II war-built destroyer escort. In today's video, we're going to talk about the high-low concept of building a fleet. Many of you, uh, like me, think a lot about naval construction, the types of ships we would use. Uh, when we play war games, we have to come up with the ideal distribution of ships in the fleet. And this is something that the Navy thinks about considerably. The high-low concept is a term coined by Admiral Elmo Zumwalt uh, probably in the 1960s. But it's a concept that's probably as old as time. He's just the one who put a name to it. Stuart is an example of a low-end asset, whereas Battleship New Jersey would be an example of a high-end asset. In many of my videos, I call Battleship New Jersey a gold plater. The Navy spares no expense when they're building the ship. They build her out of armor plate, STS steel. Uh, they put like really complex curves into the hull of the ship. They use a mix of riveting and welding depending on which technology is better for that area. There's a lot of non-ferrous metals like bronze incorporated into the design. Uh, she is a pre-war design back when resources and time were much less of a concern than wartime. Stewart, on the other hand, they slapped this bad girl together in a couple of months, uh, entirely welded out of mild steel, relatively thin plates, about a quarter inch or three eighths, uh, depending on the area. And you can see these weld beads. They're not made by master welders. Uh, it is done by your titular Rosie the Riveters, who often were doing welding work like this, not riveting work. Uh, and you could mass produce these and turn them out one after another. And that's how we end up winning the Battle of the Atlantic. We're able to flood the Atlantic with so many convoy escorts, ships like Stuart, that they can not only protect the convoys that are out there, but they can form hunter-killer groups that go out and attack German U-boats before the convoy is even threatened. Uh, but putting that many ships out is really expensive, and a peacetime Navy isn't going to do that. During the interwar period, the Navy starts looking at uh, building really high-end destroyers and then really low-end destroyer escorts. And at that time, they do not choose to proceed with that. At this time, destroyers are limited to 1,500 tons by international treaties like the Washington and London treaties, uh, while some destroyer leaders for each Navy are allowed to be 2,000 tons. So uh, this is significantly larger than World War I era destroyers. And so these interwar destroyers become known as the gold platers. And that terminology continues. They are capable of doing everything. They have high speeds so they can attack enemy ships. They carry torpedoes for attacking battleships, uh, five-inch guns and other anti-aircraft guns for anti-aircraft work. They carry uh, depth charges for anti-submarine work. They are really a jack-of-all-trade, and they're not just carrying one or two of these systems. Uh, they tend to have four or five five-inch guns. They tend to have uh, five to 10 uh, or even 12 and 16 at times torpedo tubes. Uh, some of the destroyer leaders have eight five-inch guns. They have uh, dozens of depth charge racks and Y guns and K gun depth charge throwers. Uh, so these things are built to the treaty limits and they can carry a lot. And so they've got a little bit of expense associated with them. So the Navy also starts exploring the concept of building smaller, cheaper ships in the thousand ton range like USS Stewart. And they choose not to at this time. One, because they're going to be inferior to other ships. Two, if you can get funding for a destroyer, why would you put that funding towards a smaller ship rather than a, less, uh, a more capable ship? And three, we've got a bunch of World War I era four stacker destroyers laying around that meet that low end goal. Uh, and that's really why the high-low concept isn't adopted until the 1960s, because the Navy constantly has older ships laying around. Now, obviously, during World War II, uh, we start to build ships every place on the spectrum, from wooden-hauled minesweepers that you can churn out in a week and PT boats, all the way up to Iowa-class battleships that are hyper-complex. 
super difficult to uh, build, manufacture, train a, a full-size crew for. So everything in between, including full-size and half-size destroyers. And then in the interwar years, of course, you've still got this high-low mixture of ships uh, because you've got all these war-built ones. And as you build new ships, those attain the high position. And as older ships uh, come down, they occupy the lower position because ships tend to get larger over time, so the newer ones are, are the higher positions. Well, as the Navy transitions into an all-volunteer military, you start to see more and more of these older World War II era ships being decommissioned. And we have never built anywhere near as many modern ships as we had during World War II. So in the 60s, 70s, and by the 1980s, when all of these World War II era ships are out of service, uh, the Navy doesn't really have that many low-end ships left. So this is where Admiral Zumwalt's concept comes in. Uh, you build high-end, super expensive, super capable ships, Ticonderoga-class cruisers, Arleigh Burke-class destroyers, and then low-end ships like the Perry-class frigates uh, that are significantly more disposable. Your low-end ships are the ones that uh, sail in peacetime. Uh, they are your frontline units. They go and make your neighbors feel good. They will uh, operate with other nations' navies because they're about the same size as what other NATO members are able to operate. Uh, in fact, several NATO members buy Perry class frigates from the United States. Uh, and then in wartime, these smaller, cheaper ships come back home and they do the convoy work, while the larger ships, the Ticonderoga class cruisers, that are significantly more survivable thanks to their Aegis weapon system vertical launch tubes and things like that, which are also ridiculously expensive, uh, they're the ones that go front line because they can survive in a battle space that is contested. So that is where the modern Navy comes in, where we're building every year a certain number of Arleigh Burke class destroyers to occupy those high-end positions, uh, and partly why destroyers have become the front line asset of the Navy, the role that was once held by battleships, and we're building littoral combat ships at the low end. Now, it turns out littoral combat ships are probably too low for many uh, of these jobs. So the Navy is starting to look at frigates. And so they've authorized the first of the uh, Constellation class frigates, which are gonna come back in. And I'm really glad that the Navy has restarted the frigate program. Strong enough to defeat all of the largest warships and fast enough Their investment paid off. USS Stewart and the destroyer escorts of her classes uh, of World War II is really the genesis of the modern frigate. So that whole design line that begins with these ships dies when the Perrys are decommissioned, and now it's being resuscitated with the Constellations. And so we've got uh, a good low-end ship to match the Arleigh Burks, which we're now building Flight 2As and the first of the Flight 3s. They're going to be really good high-end ships. And hopefully, the Navy will start to develop new guided missile cruisers to replace the Ticonderogas, which are being decommissioned. So uh, there's your fleet construction lesson for the day. Uh, do you think it was smart not building low-end units prior to World War II? Even though these ships are quick to build, it took years uh, for us to build them in enough numbers and design them to, to turn the tide of the Battle of the Atlantic. 1942 is the second happy time for the German Navy, and it's not until 43, 44 that you really see the tide turning. Or uh, do you think the Navy was smart to use the limiting funding they had to build first-rate units that could be sent against Japanese destroyers in the Pacific? Let us know in the comments section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate your support. Consider going to the link in the description below to support the Galveston Naval Museum and their ships, USS Kavala and USS Stewart. You can also support their museum and ours by liking, sharing, and subscribing. Uh, there's a link to their YouTube channel down below so you can see the content they're putting out. And uh, the more people you share this to, the more people find out that we exist. Thanks for watching.